Hey everyone, welcome back to another live stream here on the channel. Nick here talking science of endurance and everything sports science in general. We'll give a couple of minutes to let everyone come in uh, and I'll actually get rid of this one. I don't know why that one shows up on my screen. Um, we have a few minutes to, to get a few people in here getting ready to ask their questions uh, as usual on a Wednesday. We've already got one uh, from Alan, one of our uh, channel members, to, was a part of Team NJ Sports Science. who have been watching the videos recently. I'm going to get to that in a minute in how you can be a part of it, get those questions in a little bit early uh, and also show up in the chat and you might be able to see on the, on the side here, um, Alan's little name has a little badge next to it to identify he is a member. So our members do get priority in the chats on the live stream. Make sure we get to their questions first and I'll get to it uh, a little bit later on in terms of how you can join up to be a member. So we'll give it a little bit to get started, get a few people in. Um, hopefully people are jumping across now. Uh, bang on, seven o'clock as always, Melbourne time. We'll, we'll get stuck into the questions tonight. I do want to go through a couple of things. I put up a poll on Instagram just before asking uh, if it was a good idea or not if I go and put some of the new stuff uh, that I got today onto my road bike, new set of cranks, uh, saddle, and sort of getting all that sorted and, and finished up. It's kind of a 50-50 response. So I thought, you know what, I'm not going to have enough time to get everything set up in the background here, get the bike and all that. And I, I was sort of in a bit of a rush to get things, uh, get things moving. So didn't have enough time, but I'm going to go through what I got uh, and talk a little bit about um, sort of my, I guess the the choices I've made in terms of uh, changing the crank length and why I've gone with the saddle that I've gone for to make my road cycling as, as comfortable as possible. I want to get on the road bike a little bit more, use it for commuting uh, to and from work, hopefully a little bit more as well. And uh, yeah, getting stuck uh, into a little bit more off legs conditioning as part of my preparation for for next season uh, in terms of the football side of things and the running. Doing a little bit of cycling doesn't hurt, but then also may, maybe try and squeeze in a few sprint distance triathlons early next year because we've just heard that Melbourne is going to get some racing in January, which is really, really exciting. So I'm going to get stuck into um, bringing out some of the stuff that I, some of the stuff I got. Some of it's not too exciting. I mean, if we, if I go through some of the the necessities that I had to get, first of all, tube of grease to be able to get the uh, the cranks in and not have them seize up down the track and, and the the um, tool to be able to unlock the, the little cap on the side of the cranks, obviously a critical one. I couldn't find one um, lying around at home. So it's got one, got another one. Um, I'm sure there's a number of different variations. This probably isn't the cheapest one to get. So if you've got any recommendations other than that, probably a bit late, but I figured it, it was the one that I knew was gonna basically fit um, fit what I needed. Um, I'm gonna go through and just may as well start unpacking. I haven't even taken off the packaging because I've been at work all day. Uh, we are back in the lab doing testing. So apologies that a little bit loud. If you're a Melbourne based athlete um, or in Victoria, in particular, you want to come in and get some VO2 max testing done. We are back in the lab um, doing VO2 max testing, blood lactate analysis, understanding training zones, uh, your endurance performance, establishing that baseline, and, and having a look at where where we're sort of uh, where we're sort of at. Obviously, coming out of a lockdown period, it's a bit interesting to see how some athletes have handled it and some athletes haven't. Um, or, or to to put it better, who who's declined and who's maintained is probably the better thing. Not too many athletes are, are improving above where their baselines pre lockdown were. Just from a availability aspect, um, limitations on one hour's physical activity a day when we had that in Melbourne, um, going to the two hours, no racing, things like that. Obviously, we're going to have some uh, declines in what some of the athletes are going to be doing because they were just limited in what they could be able to go and train lesser than what they normally would. So if you are interested in coming in for a test, definitely get in contact. Uh, if you are based in Victoria, um, we are able to be open to uh, people who are traveling from up in regional Victoria and also Metro as well. Uh, we're pretty sort of busy this week and next week, but look out for some availability uh, beyond that as well. Get in touch if you are interested from a testing side of things. Um, while people are still jumping in, this is more for the guys on the, the replay as well. Uh, and if you are watching this later, I'm going to go through and show you what I got. Um, in terms of saddle, went with the, the Pro Stealth um, saddle mainly uh, on a recommendation from one of the athletes that I coach. He had it recommended to him uh, from the guy who did my time trial bike fit. Um, so definitely something that... Uh, was on the top of my list to look at. Um, he's also got the same, the, the guy I'm, I'm coaching as well, um, he's also got the same road bike as me. We're pretty sort of similar, I guess, similar size frame and things like that. So in terms of understanding the comfort aspects, we've got similar saddles on our on our time trial bikes. If that similar saddle is going to work for him, this one I, I think is going to do really well. But the, the main reason I got, um, got a, a saddle that has a cutout in the middle is probably the big thing that I was looking for. I just have the standard saddle on the... Uh, on the road bike currently. And the real reason, I'll see if I can try and get this out. Um, have, like I said, haven't opened it uh, yet. Is this, 
zip tied in. I hope not. Maybe it is. It might be zip tied in. I'm not entirely sure. Oh, there we go. That probably helps me actually uh, pulling it out of the box. That works. Um, main sort of reason for getting the the pressure relief on the on the saddle and having that that open channel in the middle is I get quite sore um, sitting down and just the position of, of the pelvis in general. Um, so having the pressure relief was a big big sort of ticket item for me. Um, having something that was a little bit just more comfortable as well uh, in terms of shape. Um, probably just a little bit lighter too than the standard saddle. I've got a Focus as Alco Max. Um, if anyone's interested in, in looking at that, I've just got the, the mechanical um, Ultegra version. So um, chucking this one on is gonna definitely upgrade the comfort in terms of the ride. Uh, but absolutely loving the disc brakes on that and big shout out to Croydon Cycle Works for, for help setting that up and, and getting that bike to me uh, earlier in the year. Been really, really good so far, but wanna be able to uh, be a bit more comfortable when I'm riding. So this was, a, this was an obvious choice to be able to add um, add to the bike and the, the frame of rule. So looking forward to getting that one on. And then the other one is the big box down the bottom here. The Shimano Altegra um, 165mm crank set. Um, the bike, when I got it, it came with a 172.5, which I didn't know it came with at the time. And I kind of went, oh, I'll just see how it goes. And after a few rides, I kind of worked out that it was going to give me a bit more grief than what I was sort of after. So... Dropping down to the 165, me being relatively short, it works really well on my time trial bike and I really like that being able to, um, just that shorter length crank. And in terms of the force production side of things as well, not being very big and not being able to turn turn the power, the longer the crank, the greater the, the force you need to be able to apply through it because it's just a longer lever at the end of the day. So um, what does that mean? If I can't produce as much force with a longer lever, it's going to fatigue me probably a little bit more, I'll put a little bit more stress on my lower back um, particularly as well. It's going to impact the bike fit in general, uh, and then the economy or efficiency side of things in terms of turning pedals over, I like to sit at a little bit higher cadence, so maybe like 85, 90-ish at the best of times, particularly when the power goes up, I like to spin a bit quicker. So it's the type of thing that uh, the, the shorter cranks are gonna help me achieve that and be a little bit more economical. Um, just gone for the standard, I'm pretty sure I went with the standard 52. Yes, 5236 uh, chain rings. I'm not a, I, I'm not one to really stuff around and be pedantic about my chain ring selection. I've stayed pretty much 5236 on most of, if not all of my bikes, other than a mountain bike. Um, I like it. It gives me good flexibility to to ride uh, pretty much anywhere. I, I again, I don't really race, so it, it, from a road bike perspective or, or road cycling perspective, so it's the type of thing I'm not really concerned about. Do I need my setup in terms of crank set and cassette to be climbing based or really effective for, for crits or sprinting or anything like that. I just want something that's going to be comfortable and allow me to do some off legs conditioning, which is the main purpose of, uh, of having, having the road bike and a little bit of commuting as well. Um, obviously with beach road, if everyone, who, anyone who knows Melbourne and Victoria, we've got beach road at the end of the street at the moment. So it's uh, pretty hard not to get out there and get involved when the weather is good. I was going to try and get out today, but uh, it started to rain this afternoon and, and turned sort of pretty yuck. So might have to set it up on the trainer. Um, and go through and get back into the Zwift side of things. So I'm going to jump into uh, Alan's question tonight um, just to see if we get some others jumping in. We might end up with a bit of a short live stream tonight if there aren't too many uh, others jumping in here. But Alan has been kind enough. I think he mentioned uh, offline that he did have to get into work. Uh, he's working via shift work. So I really appreciate him jumping in and, and leaving his uh, leaving his question in here. And we'll, we'll kick, thing, kick things off with... Uh, Question four tonight, how does results of a lab testing um, compare or convert to running on the road? So what Alan's probably referring to here, and um, he can let me know later when we when we do catch up, is, is talking about um, probably the treadmill difference. What's the difference between running on the road or running around a track versus running on the treadmill? And he says here, surely there are some differences. And you're absolutely right. The main thing is when we're on a treadmill, I mean, the, the key thing that we're looking at is on the treadmill, you've got that assistance. You're not having to necessarily generate the uh, the speed or you're not necessarily having to generate the pace. You, you get pulled into hip extension. So foot lands on the treadmill, the belt's moving underneath you and it pulls you back rather than when you land on the ground out in the road, you have to create all of that drive and propulsion forward. Um, so there is gonna be some subtle difference there in terms of, all right, maybe on a treadmill we can cheat it a little bit if you have a little bit of a floaty, when I say floaty or quite bouncy style in terms of running. You can kind of skip the belt a little bit, make it a little bit easier for you. 
so you you kind of you kind of selling yourself short. But as long as you stay accountable, the treadmill is going to be reasonably accurate. Now, a lot of studies out there say that one percent on a treadmill, so one percent gradient running, from for most speeds is going to be pretty equivalent to the road. We're lucky at um, the the lab testing facility that we um, that we work at. We've done some testing with like the Stride power meters. Had athletes come in with that, test their power meter information on um, on the treadmill versus their power meter information on um, outside on the road. And we end up getting, uh, from a running power meter perspective, we end up getting similar power ratings for those same paces when we're running road and treadmill. So what does that tell us? That tells us we've got a really well calibrated treadmill and we're getting some accurate speed ratings. But for the most part, um, and we've gone, we've been quite particular in some of the equipment that we use in terms of testing. Obviously, we want the most accurate data and most uh, most consistent and repeatable data. But in a lot of cases, running at about 1% gradient in some of the literature is shown to be pretty a, a much better guide if you've just got a, a standard, if you're heading to a gym, you've got a standard treadmill, you might have one at home. 1% gradient is probably just a little bit more accurate because the calibration on the speed might be out. Um, that can happen over time as well. A bit of wear on the treadmill is probably going to push it out. So making sure it's up up to date, um, check that everything's working, the belt's running smoothly, all of that, and maintaining the treadmill is obviously key. But yeah, really the main, the main difference comes down to... Um, how are you producing that movement? Like I said, treadmill, the, the belt of the treadmill is going to pull you into hip extension. Whereas out in the road, you have to create all of that hip extension yourself. So pushing through, propelling, um, that's why the 1% grading kind of makes up for that. It makes you step forward, not allow you to cheat it and, and sort of jump because you're lifting the gradient. It's a shorter stride length. So you always, you, you pick your cadence up a little bit. You have to some, kind of self-propel a little bit. Um, from a transferability as long as you're using something that's consistent um, and and making sure that you you understand that there is reasonable consistency, like I said, our treadmill uh, that we've got in the lab is pretty good between outdoors and running on the treadmill. We get good consistency there. And when we go on prescribed sessions, athletes go away, they do them and they feel like um, it's the same pace as what I was running on the treadmill. The, the psychological aspect of running on a treadmill feels like it's faster um, because you're not moving anywhere in time and space. Um, so it always t- sometimes feels like you're running a bit quicker than you actually are or the pace that is, it might say five minute K pace on the treadmill, it feels like you're running at 4.30s. That's just that weird sensation you get off a treadmill um, side of things. But as soon as we transfer it out to the road, it does pretty well. But for the most part, 1% gradient is a good starting point just to try and match up that accuracy as you can. And you might find it might vary. Um, the higher the pace you go, you might actually find it ends up being quite a similar physiological stimulus. Be mindful of that. Have a look at things like heart rate. Um, have a look at if you've got power, that's a really good indicator too. The, the watches are, are an interesting one. Unless you've got a foot pod, it, it doesn't do too well, um, particularly on the side of things where we're looking at indoor sessions and estimating what your pace would be. I did a session yesterday indoors, quite hot here in Melbourne. It's sort of 30, 30 plus degrees uh, most of the day. So I thought for uh, in between clients at work, I'd jump on the treadmill and do it in an interval session there. Getting the pace on my watch versus what the pace on the treadmill was telling me. At, at some times I was aiming, I was doing six by two minutes on at about 325 pace. Um, on the treadmill, the equivalent of that 17, was it 17.2 Ks an hour, 17.3 Ks an hour, something like that. Um, and my watch was telling me for half of the interval that I was running at five minute pace or 4.30 pace and it just took forever to adjust. adjust. I'm not using a foot pod, but like I said, if you use the foot pod, you might get a bit more consistency. But there's some ideas around how you could try to work out that consistency. Power meter is a really good one, I think, for that. Um, and that's why I sort of like the idea of using a power meter for running as long as we're getting some accurate readings there. And when we talked about stride, I know we brought it up last week in terms of the stride power meter um, and using that as a metric to then look at, is that more accurate for understanding our pace? From a power perspective, it's a physiological output that is external. So we're not worried about, um, is, the, is the treadmill calibrated correctly? Do we have to run at 1%? Do we have to run on the flat? Whatever it is, it's just, I need to create 300 watts and 300 watts on the road equates to a certain pace for you it's going to be different to everyone but it, it'll it'll equate to a certain pace um until your economy changes likely um or something drastically changes your running technique those types of things should stay consistent so that's where i kind of find it it's a little bit easier to then manage that as well when you have that uh, additional metric that's going to allow it to measure but outside of that um one percent like i said is kind of the the benchmark for what we talk about because yeah there is going to be some difference because running on the road is fundamentally it's different to running on a treadmill isn't it i i much prefer running on the road some athletes like to do a lot of their sessions on the treadmill whichever way you like to do it is perfectly fine but um it, it, you just got to understand well what particularly if you have been tested what does that actually mean for how i'm going to train if i'm going to go and run on treadmills then 
I need to make sure that the treadmill that I'm running on is repeating what the treadmill I was running on in the lab. Um, we, we can have difference there. If you put in 19 k's an hour to a treadmill at a commercial gym, it may not actually be 19 k's an hour. They might cap it a little bit um, within the within the protocol, just purely from the fact that um, purely from the fact that it's like trying to limit you from a just a safety perspective. Um, they might have that within the treadmill, maybe, maybe not, but type of thing that on the on the road you're not going to have that restriction so you got to keep all of these things uh, in mind so hopefully it gives you a little bit i know i've rambled a little bit there but gives a bit of an insight in terms of the difference between running on the road and the treadmill and how you can then apply that lab testing result uh, and make sure you're getting the most uh, most out of it um got caleb welcome welcome in mate i know you responded to the uh to the instagram poll about whether i should chuck the cranks on um yes i did change to 165 just got um uh, i just went through it before you might have missed it but the 52 uh 36 uh, chain rings with the 165 mil Altegra cranks uh, is what I have swapped to on the road bike, exactly the same as what I'm running on my time trial bike to, to try and match it as much consistency as I can between the two. But also 165 for, for some of my height and being relatively short just works a little bit better from an efficiency and a comfort perspective um, as well. And then matching that, as I said before, matching that with the, the new saddle, um, the Pro Stealth is going to be a, a, a good combo, I reckon, for, for making that that new that new road bike of mine that that has done a few k's but not massive amounts and I'm looking forward to getting to some more k's as summer keeps uh, continues to roll around but um, make that thing a little bit more comfortable but then also a lot more economical a lot more efficient so um, everyone's slightly everyone's slightly different with the crank selection too a, a, a lot of it comes down to it's not necessarily as simple as the taller you are the longer cranks you should have um, I know plenty of athletes who are a little bit sort of similar height to me who might run maybe a 170 mil crank. Um, that's that's perfectly so normal. See, it really comes down to how does that then work in from a fit perspective. I tend to, I, I, in terms of body proportions, I have quite a long torso and quite short legs in how I'm made up. So having the shorter cranks definitely gives me an advantage. But athletes of the same height who might have a shorter torso and slightly longer legs um, are going to maybe want that 170 uh, mil crank. Obviously, a really tall athlete can probably get away with a, a, a 170, 172 and a half. And me just running that that long crank just wasn't working. So 165 is is uh, the way I'm going down to. If anyone wants or, or needs a Shimano, basically brand new Shimano Altegra 172.5 uh, mil crank set, um, let me know. Happy to happy to work out a deal. I'm not going to be doing anything with it necessarily. It's probably just going to be sitting around for a while, um, not doing a lot. So if anyone's interested uh, in one of those, again, it's a 5236 uh, set of chain chain rings on there. Basically brand new. Haven't haven't done too many Ks on it, so um, that'd be that'd be ready and available if anyone knows anyone who might be interested in a brand new crank set. Again, it's one seventy two and a half, so not ideal for most people because I know the one sixty five is pretty popular, and the one seventy is probably the the, the next. But um, if there anyone is out there who happens to happens to want those longer cranks, uh, let me know because happy to happy to work something out and uh, get them out to you as well. Um, just while we're going through uh, while while we're Maybe waiting for a couple more questions to come through uh, in the chat tonight. We'll see how we go. I just wanted to share with anyone who's watching on the replay as well. I know a lot of uh, a lot of people, particularly our international audience, um, who can't make the time zone uh, for whatever reason, wherever they are in the world. It's probably like middle of, middle of the night or um, during the, the during the working day in other parts of the world. I just wanted to take you through what the the new join button is uh, up on the channel. You might have seen me mention it in a couple of videos, and I talked about it a little bit. Um, a little bit last week, but we do have this join button now. Um, you can see here, if I get my mouse to, there we go. This little join button here, obviously your your perspective of my channel will be a little bit different to this, but um, you will see the, the join button. You can click on that one and that will take you to uh, be able to join up as a member to Team NJ Sports Science. You can see here for less than a coffee a month, uh, you can gain access to not only these cool little badges next to your name, so you're easy, easy to identify in the chat, there's also going to be a number of uh, benefits. At the moment, we've just got the access there to uh, members only live chat, which is also the priority in the chat too. So as we saw Alan's question at the beginning, he's got the little badge next to his name. Whenever I see one of those pop up, you'll get the priority in these Q&A sessions, particularly as we continue to grow them. Each week, we're getting some variability of um, how many people are watching and joining in. So as we grow, having one of these badges next to your name is, is going to definitely help you to stand out from the crowd and allow me to get to your question um, a little bit quicker. There's going to be some more perks along the way as well. Some uh, some members only content uh, is where I'm sort of looking in the future. Maybe some stuff on uh, in the works uh, from a apparel side of things. Maybe some caps, socks. I'm a big sock and cap fan. As you can tell, I'm always wearing a cap in one of these live streams. So um, 
it, it's the type it's the type of thing that some of those things will be available to members only. So plenty to look out for in that space. We've already got a handful of people who have signed up and joined. Uh, if anything, it also helps me uh, uh, be a bit more people are leaning on it leaning on it, and tell youtube to to cut out as many ads on the videos as possible i know that's something that that frustrates people at times is having to watch ads in the middle of the video i can turn all of those features off if we get more and more members joining um because it just kind of takes the pressure off me uh having the, the the button that says yeah turn ads on the video sometimes i so i don't really like putting them on but it does help me sort of keep things ticking over to buy equipment for to make these videos spend some time doing these live streams taking time out of work and, and you need to do it so uh, the more people who can support the channel in that way that's really appreciated and it does help me um do a little bit more with uh with the content here on the channel and, and continue to bring you some great stuff great we've got to, a couple of questions floating in uh, in the comments just while i was talking there so perfect uh, perfect timing to me for me to segue into them let's get into uh we'll just go top to bottom and, and rank down um Go on here from Leaks. Uh, apologies again for everyone who uh, they, their username is the only thing I can identify them by. Um, if you if you do want your your actual name um, in there, just let me know in the chat and I'll, I'll give you a bit of a shout out later on. But um, I'll go by username first until I until I hear otherwise. How would you go about off season endurance training for soccer players? Long and slow runs, hit, etc. Really good question. I actually covered this um, a little bit talking about in the video I did earlier this week talking about how do you balance two two sports? How do you train for for me personally, I train for umpiring football in most of the year, and then I train for triathlon. And triathlon is kind of my off season. So when I look at it for a team sport athlete, and you're only training for something like soccer, football, basketball, whatever your sport is, um, might be field hockey, anything where there's a much more aerobic demand, and things like soccer is a perfect example. Depending on your position, you might alter this slightly, but the general advice would be during your off season, um, give yourself first and foremost a bit of recovery and, and rest. Allow yourself to regenerate after that long season i know how how it can get you do a big pre-season you're training through your off season and then you've got a whole year's worth of uh, matches to get through finals um, championships etc wh whatever your your competition demands the off season first and foremost got to get some recovery and give you don't necessarily have to drop everything but maybe just do like one or two very unstructured sessions during the week um go and try something different go and swim go and um go and play a different sport for a couple of weeks just give yourself some of that variety and just allow yourself to switch off and, and really replenish then when you're in that off season period where you're not quite you haven't quite started pre-season it's usually like a month two month type period where you're sort of floating in between you haven't quite started the full-on preparation yet but you kind of you might be still on your own you're not working with the team yet really just a, a basic combination of a couple of longer slower runs and when i say longer slower if we're looking at soccer, the longest you're going to have to absolutely, like if you were running 100% of the time and you know in soccer you're not going to be, you're going to be walking for, for periods, you're going to be sprinting for periods. But if you had to hold one speed for the, a, the longest period of time in a game, the absolute maximum that's going to be is what, 40, 45 minutes, maybe plus a little bit extra time on. But 45 minutes is going to be the absolute longest you're ever going to have to be continuously working in a game. And like I said, even then it's going to be shorter because there's going to be stops and starts in the nature of team sport. I would go out and do maybe two, if you're planning on running like four times a week, two runs where you're just going out and cruising nice and easy, conversational intensity, um, three to four out of 10, long and slow. Build yourself up from, say, running for 20 minutes in, in a single go to 25 to 30, 35, 40. You can probably take one of those, so one of those two runs up to maybe an hour. That would be more than enough um, in, in terms of some volume in the legs. And again, we're not pushing the intensity here. It's just building some Ks in the legs some aerobic, uh, aerobic capacity work. The other one, you might only build up to sort of half an hour. So there's an hour and a half worth of running for the week and it's in two sessions. The other stuff, you might want to just add in some, uh, again, some high intensity interval training to an extent, but maybe we're more focused a little bit on some longer intervals, two minutes on, two minutes off, or maybe even three minutes on, three minutes off, just below VO2 max. You're not working at really, really hard intensity stuff like 30 second on, 30 second off or 10 second on, 10 second off you might do later in pre-season. We're looking at big aerobic adaptations here. We just want to get your aerobic engine as functional as possible and just get you as aerobically fit as possible. So things like two to four minutes on, each of those efforts followed by an equal walking recovery. So two minutes on at nine, nine and a half out of 10 RPE. If we're looking at RPE, if you're looking at percentage of VO2 max, 95% of VO2 max, 95 uh, 95 or 90 to 95 percent mas if you're using mas max aerobic speed so based on your 2k time trial uh, average speed all of these things we can work in um doing some efforts there 
two minutes on at that 95, two minutes walking. Repeat that five, six times, and that's your session done, maybe two of those a week. Even then, for an off-season period, you might want to do one high-intensity session, two long, slow, and alternate that. Just three runs in the week is, is still more than enough because you might go and do a, a different sport. Like I said, you might go and do some cycling. You might do some swimming. Change that up a bit to still get an aerobic stimulus. But if you are looking just purely at running, if you want to run four times a week, I'd do two long, slow. And when I say long, the longest you probably want to get to is maybe an hour. That's all you really need to do. And even then, that might be a bit excessive in terms of volume. The other one would probably be like half an hour, maybe 40 minutes if you were really keen and you're getting into your running. Again, it's just top up. Like you, you, That's probably the run that you don't necessarily have to do. And then a couple of couple of sessions where you just keep the intensity up there to maintain as much of that top end of your fitness as you can. So you can come back to pre-season. You don't want to be peaking first week of pre-season. You don't want to be as fit as possible then. You want to be as fit as possible for the start of the season. So you want to just come back to pre-season so then you can build on that rather than I've gone backwards because I've just taken a couple of months off. I get to pre-season and I'm starting from zero. You want to be, all right, let's start from maybe 75% or 80% of what we can absolutely get to and allow that 20% to develop over the pre-season period because you have a couple of months, uh, usually sort of two and a half, three months of a pre-season for most most teams to be able to get there. So hopefully that answers your question there in terms of how I'd go about it. That's very similar to how I go about it. I work a little bit more in, in um, doing some stuff with, with cycling and, and swimming as well as the running because I like the triathlon side of things. But if you just want to go and run, two two slower runs, two high intensity runs, um, and even then, just be mindful of how high intensity go. That sort of in and around VO two max, some longer efforts, but then long recoveries as well. Um, very easy recoveries, like a walking recovery, is a good option. That'll just keep that high intensity into your legs um, and, and into your body a, a little bit more than than neglecting it completely and leaving it aside. Um, again, hopefully that answers that one. Let me know in the let me know in the chat if you you want to continue that discussion about uh, off season conditioning for team sports in general. If anyone else is in here training team sports let me know uh in the chat always always can to sort of discuss some alternatives obviously there's a big endurance component to your your sports as well rather than our traditional sort of marathon runners and triathletes might be popping in here and there um team sport is obviously something that I, i'm quite passionate about too because as much as i'm not playing i'm still involved in that team sport environment and um in in the i understand what it takes to to be at those those sort of elite levels in in that sort of space and, and competing in that stop start sort of nature event um, moving back into uh, Cal, we've got another one here. Getting excited uh, for the PTO uh, pro, pro Triathlete Organization Championships, I assume is what you're talking about there. In a few weeks, backing Lionel Sanders to take out the short course. It's an interesting one with Lionel. Um, Lionel's, like, he could be so good. Like, he, he's physiologically and in theory, he's just the perfect athlete. Like, you look at some of his numbers and they're ridiculous. I think he broke. He recently broke the, the one-hour Canadian record on the track in the velodrome for his, from his cycling perspective. He's a phenomenal athlete, but he has this just absolute habit of bombing on race day. I don't know, what, and when it counts. So I don't, I don't know what it is with, um, in that side of things, whether whether it is when he gets to race day, he just hasn't been able to work out how to put it together psychologically, whether he's just tapering in incorrectly. I think in the short the short course, um, I, I would I tend to go with you a little bit more so in short course compared to if we were talking about like if Kona was coming up. Um, the short course I think suits me a bit more because there's less time to get things wrong. Long course, you, you always got more time to, to shoot yourself in the foot if you like. So I think you, you're probably onto something there in terms of backing backing Lionel in for the short course. But uh, again, I'm always very wary of could he, could he just blow himself up uh, and implode probably even before he gets to the, the start line and then it kind of just doesn't come together as part of the race. I don't know too many. I don't know too much about the the championships. I haven't really looked into it too much. But I also feel like there's going to be some big names racing. If, if someone like Lionel's getting in amongst it, because let's face it, there hasn't been much racing. You, you can't write off maybe. I don't know if um, guys like Brownlee or anything like that are racing, but you can't write some of them off too. And and then obviously the the short course like a specialist, the guys who do the short course stuff really well, and that's all they race. Some of the younger guys. The extra pace in the legs might might get guys like Lionel who, yeah, they're super fit, but they just don't have the speed to go with it. You, you watch an Olympics um, or a Commonwealth Games standard distance triathlon, for example, and some of the, like some of those guys are, are X fifteen or not fifteen hundred X like ten thousand meter runners on the track, and they go into triathlon. They just they run ten thousand meter elite times, but um, after they've come off the bike, it's just ridiculous. So, be interesting to see how it goes. Um, I'm going to be keeping an eye on it now. I'll be, be keen to hear other people's thoughts in the in the chat as well, what they think about who 
who might be a chance um, and, and just to hear a little bit more about what's what's going on. Obviously, PTO is doing a little bit more and more, becoming a little bit more active, which I think is good in the space in terms of triathlon, someone representing those pro athletes and just having a bit more professionalism around um, around the, the elite end of our um, the spectrum in terms of triathlon as a sport is always always useful. Keep the, keep, keep the organizations um, in the favor of athletes rather than uh, the other way around. So... Great, uh, great little point there, Caleb. I appreciate you jumping in and, and leaving that one in there. Good discussion point. We can we can start to start to work through. Moving down, um, the big fella, welcome back uh, into into the chat, mate. Um, is working at the same slash similar heart rate on the bike going to use the same amount of energy as running? Um, in theory, I, I get where you're going. This in terms of. Uh, same relative intensity is what you're probably more looking at in terms of the same amount of energy in rough terms. There's going to be some difference because running and running and cycling are, are ultimately different. We've got different movement patterns. There's different muscle groups involved. Therefore, we're going to have different energy um, energy requirements for each of those uh, each of those disciplines. In terms of if we look at the same heart rate on the bike versus um, versus what we would get on the run. So let's say 150 beats per minute on the run you'd probably be looking at anywhere between 140, 145 beats per minute um, for that same relative intensity on the bike. And where we identify this is things like lactate threshold. Our threshold should be at very similar parts of our physiology. If we're equally trained on both, again, equally trained, if you're more of a cyclist than you are a runner or more of a runner than a cyclist, it's going to be varied. But if we say equally trained bike and run, you, where's your lactate threshold? It's probably going to be five to seven beats per minute lower in terms of heart rate at threshold on the bike compared to the run. Why? Lower body's doing all the work. You don't have to pump as much blood to the upper body because your arms are just chilling out, um, having a bit of a rest. So from that perspective, you, you probably, if we're looking at equal heart rates and equivalent uh, intensities there, same amount of energy, probably not. Um, there, there's a lot more going on from a running perspective. Also, we're dealing with the impact. That's going to take a bit of, or sap a bit of energy out of us in terms of landing, absorbing the force, then producing the force again to go, whereas the bike is just a little bit more roll it over. We also have plenty of assistance. You think about how much assistance you get through your drivetrain, rolling resistance. Um, when you're out on the road, there are some parts of the pedal stroke where you can kind of coast through and you'll feel that. Running, you can't do that. So you're probably, in most cases, you're going to be expending more energy running than you would be uh, would be cycling. Yeah, as a whole, as a general rule, but it's the type of thing. If we're at equivalent intensities, you're going to be producing similar amounts of energy because we're at things like VO2 max equivalently, or we're at uh, threshold as, as an equivalent. Um, excuse me. I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you can hear it. It always does me. This happened a few weeks ago, started to rain outside. Um, I don't know if it comes through the microphone. Let me know if it does uh, or not. And I might play around with a few things, but it, all, it always gets in my ear and I don't, I can never remember if you guys can hear it or not. Um, so yeah, hopefully that sort of sums up in terms of if you're at the, the same equivalent, really, if you're at the same heart rate, the bike should theoretically be a little bit easier um, to, to manage because the heart rate is going to be a little bit lower, but keep in mind that that's going to be maintained most of the way through as well um, uh, across your across your training. So general rule, running, you should be expending more energy than the bike, um, particularly if you're equally trained. If you're unequally trained, like if you're, if you're a much stronger runner than you are cyclist on the bike, you might be burning a lot more energy at a much lower relative intensity. That's where it gets a little bit complicated, a little bit more individual um, for the most part more energy used on the run because there's just more involved, more to the movement, more impact, um, more requirement for you to burn that fuel. But yeah, good question. Good question. Always looking at that that comparison, particularly for our triathletes out there, that comparison between bike and run. What are some of our differences? Always a really good discussion point to, to bring up in a, in a live stream like this where we've got plenty of people who might be interested in that same topic. Um, moving through into the next one, um, techie question. I think um, thinking back to a comment section, I didn't get to it, but... Let me know if, I, if I'm right on this one. Had a question um, asking about the whoop band on the similar lines. Let me know in the chat if I got that right. Um, I guess on the back of um, talking about wearables and technology, um, had, a, had a comment come through asking about HRV and whoop, which I might get to in a second. Uh, didn't Wasn't able to get back to in the comments just before but um, of that previous video, but I'll, I'll get to it after I do this one. Techie question with wearables. Uh, what would you do to get the most accuracy out of them? Um, for example, wear higher up the arm for a heart rate monitor, etc. Did a little bit of a, a little bit of a summary of what we what need to be looking for when we're analysing some of the data uh, the other day in that video, talking about overcoming the error. And really, what we're doing here in in terms of the most accuracy um, is we're trying to one overcome any error in the device 
mainly by being as consistent as possible. It almost, for something like a wrist-based heart rate, it almost doesn't matter if you have a wrist-based or if you have the arm-based heart rate or if you have a chest strap. If you're getting the reading that you need to see on your screen, so you're getting a heart rate reading and it is mapping correctly with intensity, as intensity goes up, heart rate goes up. As intensity comes down, heart rate comes down. If you're getting things like that, it doesn't matter where you have it necessarily because each of them is designed for a specific part of the body. Some are going to work better on others, uh, on people than others. Like wrist space for me is always one that I've struggled with regardless of the device. So I always have a hard time from a wrist space perspective. Chest strap is, is my go-to personally. I know athletes who are the opposite. Um, but it's the type of thing that as long as you're consistent, if I if I just wear a wrist-based heart rate monitor, I need to wear that as many times as I can in my training sessions and do all my comparisons to those sessions where I've worn wrist-based. Or if I always wear a chest strap, I need to make sure when I'm doing comparisons in my sessions, I don't compare what I got from a chest strap to what I got from a wrist-based to what I got from an arm-based, if we're talking about heart rate monitors or any other devices. I'm not comparing my pace that I got from my foot pod on my... Um, uh, on my stride power meter or whatever it might be, I'm not getting the estimated pace there and comparing that to with what my watch did um, because I only wore one or the other. I need to be consistent in my application. That's going to give you the most accuracy in terms of what we call reliability, being able to make repeatable results. And that's what we do in the lab as well. I mean, doing a VO2 max test on um, on your own bike on a tax trainer, for example, or, or a Wahoo kicker, the Wahoo kicker or the, the, the tax Neo may not be the most accurate um smart trainer out, out there there are there are ones called cyclops that that cost thousands and thousands of dollars more than what a tax or a, or a kicker would cost they're incredibly accurate in terms of power meters they're not a calibrated ergometer that you would have in a in a more clinical setting are they repeatable and reliable yes because we use them again and again and we're constantly comparing back to them if we've got athletes who have a kicker and they want to bring their kicker in because that's what they then train on we're getting them to bring the kicker in. They do the test on that. I had one um, yesterday. I had an athlete that I'm doing some work with that he brought his kicker in because he's like, you know what, I'm going to train on that. So I, instead of having some variation between what the tax power reading is and what my kicker reading is, I'm just going to bring the kicker in and do my test on that. So that every time he goes and trains on that kicker now, he has a consistent, um, reliable metric. So that's more the important thing. First and foremost, is it measuring what it's supposed to, which is our validity? Is it measuring heart rate? And is it mapping that accordingly to... Or is it measuring power? Is it increasing when it should be? Is it decreasing when it should be? From then on, as long as you have a consistent application of that, same spot or same type of measurement, power meters, don't chop and change between smart trainer to pedal base to crank base back to pedal base. Have a consistency. Unless you're doing a, a some sort of cross comparison of different types of methods to see which one seems to be more aligned with where you're at, that's okay. If you're checking what your wrist-based heart rate versus a chest strap is versus an armband, you want to wear all three in the same session, that's all right. That's where you can change it up. But I wouldn't be wearing one on one day and then the other day trying to wear another one and then trying to make a comparison because you're going to have differences in what their error readings are um, and, and differences in how they're interpreting that data. So hope that answered that one in, re in regards to wearables. Be just consistent in your application and you're going to get the most reliable, uh, accurate result all of the commercial devices that you can buy are going to have some sort of error. So in terms of moving them around, isn't going to change their accuracy too much as long as you're wearing them how they're intended to be worn and you can, can repeat it. That's all we need to do. Coming back, I've just seen in the chat, yeah, in, uh, in regards to that whoop band question, I thought I thought uh, it did pop up. Have, have I got any experience with the whoop band? Not personally. Uh, it's something I've looked into a little bit. I've had plenty of questions on in the last little while about, about things like HRV. So for those of you who don't know, heart rate variability, the Whoop Band is a prop is a popular one. Um, I haven't personally used it, but I know people who have. Um, and the uh, is it the Aura or Aura O U R A rings? Um, I actually read a study uh, the other day that was comparing a couple of these devices and was saying that um, a lot of them are on par, but those rings are actually a little bit more accurate than the Whoop. That was just one study, so don't take my gospel word that I would go get one of those rings because I know they're quite expensive. I think like three hundred bucks. Basically, all, all these devices are doing are measuring heart rate variability. And what heart rate variability is, is the difference in the gap between beats, uh, the timing between beats. If the heart beats like this, and it, uh, it's ne it, the, the heart doesn't beat like this, should I, should I put, it's not a consistent rhythmic on each second it's going to beat. And there's an even gap between. There's always, it, it's more of a, it, it's like this random, random pattern. 
what we're looking for is the variability between those beats. How much variation do we have between beat one versus beat two versus three? The more variation, as basic level understanding as I, I have, again, not looking into it a hell of a lot, not having used it personally, um, from what the investigation I've done, the more variability we have, the better. It gives us an indication that we're, we're functioning quite well. The lesser variability, not as good. Um, so that means the heart's just getting into that more rhythmic style and nature. And a lot of this we're talking about is at resting, waking up from um, your night's sleep and checking, checking in on, all right, do we have some good heart rate variability? Is that an indicator then maybe for are we well recovered to get into a really quality session the next day? Um, uh, are we are we then ready to go into an interval session? Do we maybe need to consider adjusting the session? Was it something that we, we did in terms of sleep that was really good or something in, in terms of sleep and recovery that we need to work on? All of these things we can get an insight to. Is it something I would recommend to everyone in terms of using though? No. And the reason being, it's not like I wouldn't recommend those types of devices. The reason being for the majority of athletes who might get one, are you going to consistently use it and actually look at the data day to day over a long period of time? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, the expectation would be then to apply that and actually follow that for a significant period of time. When I say significant, minimum three to four months before you before you start being a little bit inconsistent with it to know if you're actually going to get value out of the metric. If you don't think you can commit to a three to four month period of every single day, I'm going to check it and, and take note of it, analyze it after that three to four month period and then repeat that process. If you don't think you can commit to that, I wouldn't worry about it because it's probably not conscious on your mind in terms of being uh, being involved in uh, understanding what insights can I get from this extra piece of data. Um, it, it's the same with it's the same with heart rate. Athletes who, for, who forget to put their heart rate monitor on I've had this gripe with a few of them when I've coached them and put in pro programs before. I get to analyzing their data and I can't see any heart rate. I ask them, why Why didn't we have any heart rate today? Did it not upload whatever? Oh, I just forgot to wear my heart rate monitor. Well, why would we be going out and prescribing heart rate-based training if you can't commit to using that heart rate monitor day in, day out? And that's kind of the, the perspective I take with any, any metric or any device out there is if we're going to use it and be consistent with it, then it's worthwhile getting in, invested in. Personally, I don't think for the next little while, unless I get a really, really good deal on a power meter, probably not going to get one from a road bike. Um, that's just a personal thing for me. I'm going to go out and do some zone two stuff, mainly work off heart rate when I use my road bike and just kind of enjoy the process of riding. That's my goals and focus. Yours might be different, but I invested in a power meter for my time trial bike because when I'm racing, I want to look at power so to see if I can keep a consistent effort rather than heart rate because I know heart rate's probably going to drift a bit, particularly when I race shorter distance or over, over a long period of time. You get to the 70, 80, 90K mark of a, of a 70.3 bike, your heart's probably drifted a little bit to what you would like it. Power is a much better metric there and it's going to be more consistent. That's where I'm doing more of my quality sessions anyway. So I'd rather invest in, in that component and work on things like getting the appropriate length crank so I'm comfortable on the bike and getting a comfortable saddle. These things are more of where I'm aligned with. It's the same for running. Better off getting a really a good quality watch if you're interested in, in pace and maybe heart rate rather than going and getting a whoop band because the whoop band is going to tell you HRV and what what else can it do for you? Maybe you look at um, some of these other devices that do a little bit like Apple Watch, for example, the newer ones. This is a Series 2. The Series 3 and above, um, I think, I don't, what are we up to now? I think like Series 5 or Series 6 or something on the Apple Watch. is ridiculous. Those things progress too quick for me to keep up with. Um the HRV on those is comparable to a whoop band from what some of these studies are, are saying as well. So interesting to see that some of these more, I guess, nor when I say normal devices, not a dedicated device, these devices that are looking into um, more more features, smartwatch, it connects to your phone, all of these app, app integrations, but then also it does HRV, they might be just as effective and it's giving you other bang for buck in other parts of your life as well. Getting the notifications from text calls, emails, whatever you need, um, there's a whole bunch of other functionality on it as well. Not that I'm trying to sell you an Apple Watch here, but that gives you an idea that there are some other ways you could then go about it rather than necessarily just the Whoop. So I know I kind of rambled a bit there, but in terms of how I process is something worthwhile investing in, there's some of the boxes I look to tick first. Is it is it ticking all the boxes and am I actually going to be accountable and use it day in, day out? That's probably the main question. If that's yes, then I'm probably interested in maybe making the purchase and, and getting it and trying it out. If the answer is no, Maybe not. And um, I know, Zach, uh, you've been using the Whoop Band because when we were having a chat on um, Zoom the other day, I could see it on your wrist. Um, 
and you're saying here Whoop's been <laughs> Whoop's been rad for me. Current training block um, has been smashing my uh, central nervous system, um, and it's a type, it's a type of thing. If you're really interested in the data and you're going to be able to look at it and gain some insight and make some adjustments on your training based on that, awesome. If you're not going to look at it, what's what's the point in having it? It's just a cool little colored wristband um, uh, as well. So it's a, it's the you got to weigh up the pros and cons like anything and, and make a really balanced um, balanced argument for, for the pros and cons and then have a look at, all right, what's more aligned with what I need and then also which one outweighs. If the pros significantly outweigh the cons, then it's, it's a no-brainer. But if the cons outweigh the pros, then it's just like, eh, maybe I don't need to buy into it just yet. Not to say you're going to shut the door forever, but maybe think about coming back at a different time when you might be in a different place psychologically or the way you think about training, all of these are... Uh, all these different factors. Um, coming back to Alan's question right at the beginning, he's just gonna give us a little follow up. Um, talking about uh, testing before, when we're talking about things like, um, we're talking about the treadmill versus out in the road, is there differences between lab testing and, and when you get out there, what adjustments should you make? Um, his response here is more about if, uh, for example, test says my lactate threshold is a certain pace, will that be the same pace on the road? You, you may have missed a, a little bit of what I was talking about there, but that's okay. Um, in theory, it should be. It like I said, it depends on. It really depends on what you've used to test, and if you can validate uh, the the fact that your information from that lab test is really applicable. Like I said, when for for example, with our treadmill that we've got um, at Mets Performance, we've done some uh, we've done some rough testing in terms of looking at what a stride power meter would tell us. So, a stride power meter. Let's say your let's say your threshold pace is four minute k's, four minute uh, kilometers at 300 watts based on a, a foot pod power meter out on the road. If you come into the lab and we see your lactate threshold based on your testing is at four minute K pace and your power meter data was validating that as well and it was three minute Ks, well, yes, it's going to be exactly the same. We're able to do that because our treadmill is well calibrated for testing purposes and the, and the, the purposes of assessment. Um, not like if you go to a commercial gym, that's where you're probably going to run into more issues than if you go into a place that's dedicated to more of that lab testing. And that's why I said things like a 1% gradient, like if you're running at four minute K paces lactate threshold on a 1% gradient on most treadmills is then going to be a more accurate representation of what four minute K pace out in the road is like because of those differences in how you would run on a treadmill versus how you would run on the road. Does that make a little bit more sense there? Hopefully you can get back to it. I know you, I know you um, sort of said you have some um, things on in terms of work in that tonight, but um if you, if you got the got that little point there, let me know in the chat to see if that sort of cleared it up. In most cases, it is going to be the same, but you got to make sure that, and may, you have to just question the people at, uh, from a lab testing perspective. Have they done some validation of what they're looking for um, to be able to confirm that yes, four minute K pace on this treadmill is going to be the same. I know, I know once I get higher, like the treadmill that we've got, once we get to three minute K pace, our treadmill doesn't go any faster in terms of a speed. Um, so we go up a, a percentage grade enough that to try and continue to increase the intensity. Not many athletes get there, but our pro pro guys do. They'll get to three minute K pace at six percent gradient. It's pretty ridiculous. Um, and then we make some, uh, I guess, estimates of what that equivalent is because three minute K pace up a hill is is a difficult one to pinpoint um, exactly how hard that athlete's working in terms of pace when, when we're working on a treadmill. So then we make some estimates and then we'll do some field testing to be able to clarify. Okay, was that session that we prescribed at we tried to prescribe a session at 245 pace. Was that session actually way too hard for what we were going for or was it way too easy? Was it pretty much bang on? Well, let's make some field adjustments rather than relying just solely on what we saw in a lab and, and estimating and having a bit of guesswork. We then use some of the practical side of things and go, what makes sense for us to make an adjustment? And maybe we go and do some um, do some field testing to then have a look at uh what is it actual what is our actual pace and do some time trialing or benchmarking. Um is the is then an alternative option to make sure we're really refining in are these uh, and you might even do like a benchmarking session like i know for a lot of athletes the modifier like is a good one to be like yeah these paces are accurate or these paces are way too hard or they're way too easy um it's a good one to sort of see where you're at overall it's just a form so you can use some of those in combination and as you mentioned here um most labs most labs will have a well calibrated machine absolutely particularly if you're going to a university or somewhere that specializes in testing are going to have equipment that is appropriate in most circumstances um but like i said it, as long as you're then testing on that same bit of equipment then you've got that benchmarking session in the field you could do this um on really anything you just got to know what the, the difference is between that treadmill versus what you're running on the road 
And like I said, that's where something like Stride Power Meter might be useful to then look at if you're doing your testing by yourself. If you're doing it in a lab and they can validate the fact that your, your sessions, you'll know straight away. If you do your testing, your lactate threshold comes back at four minute K pace and you go out and try and run at four minute K pace and you blow up after six Ks and you've just got nothing else left and you were completely well rested, well trained, really uh, really ready to go, well fueled up, well hydrated and you blow up at four minute K pace because really your threshold's a little bit lower. Well, then, then, then you've got that. That's where, you, or, or the other way around, flip it around. That's where you. It's obvious you've got the issues, but just go out and field test that. Um, that that's really one of the only ways you're going to be able to completely identify, other than, like I said, some of those methods before to see if there is any variation between your lab test and what you're actually experiencing out in the road. So if that answers that one and clears that one up for you, mate. Um, I know it's a bit of a tricky one. And I know you got you got the lab testing coming up uh, pretty soon, so definitely uh, if you if you do have any issues with that, just um, flick, flick it through, get in contact, and we'll we'll work through some strategies of how we can see if it aligns or um, if it, if it doesn't align, to, and we'll get really specific, uh, maybe offline uh, outside of a live live stream to, to go through it a bit more in detail once you get the once you get the test done. All right, scrolling back through, I know we just had in in those last couple of questions, we had a few few more float through. Um, coming back to Zach's one about same working time, same heart rate. Uh, intensity, compacting my power data, um, bike to Garmin running, there are massive differences in calories burned and my recovery is always um, pretty ordinary after a long, slow run. I think if I miss it, let me read this again. I think I might've just tripped over my own words there, but let me know if I'm getting it right. Um, having a look at your your power data from the bike compared to the Garmin running data, there's a massive difference in calories burned. Which ones, let me know, which one's higher? Um, which one's higher? Are you typically seeing that your bike is higher? Are you typically seeing that your run is higher? I would expect you, like I said before, I would expect your, your run to be higher because there's more movement involved. Um, and particularly a long, slow run as well. You think about how much energy you're burning over a long, slow run uh, in that duration. And I know, I know how long some of your long, slow runs are as well. You're going to be burning a lot of fuel, um, absolutely, and purely just even from that, the the added impact on the body, um, the extra movement in terms of the arms and what the torso is doing compared to what it's doing on the bike, I would expect that to be burning through a little bit more, and smashing through more of your fuel is going to lead to a bit longer recovery because you have to go and replenish and replace that. So, um, I, I would say the the run is probably going to burn a little bit more. Like I said, it's it's hard to make that comparison of direct intensity because we're talking about two different sports. Um, like if we're looking at, uh, like I said, like we were using use the example for a treadmill running versus outdoor running, at the same heart rate, at the same pace, if we've got the equal equal stats there, I would expect outdoor running to elicit more of an energy expenditure response than treadmill running because you're creating 100% of the work. You've got wind resistance. You might have some terrain changes. All of these things are now working against us. Whereas on the treadmill, you don't actually have any of that. So. I would expect the, that that circumstance to definitely be higher, but bike to run, it's always going to be difficult depending on the type of stuff you're doing. Um, if you have a really hard, intense bike session that goes for like say hour and a half, two hours, you're going to be burning a lot of fuel. Obviously, compare that to a maybe a, a two hour zone two run, maybe then it's comparable. It was really going to depend on what are you actually doing in that session. Um, but then also, I would expect in typical circumstances, if you can equate things or equal things out as best you can, running is going to elicit that higher. Um, that higher energy expenditure, um, rather ra compared to compared to the the bike side of things. Um, coming back to uh, like HRV and, and monitoring, great little, great little question on do I track sleep and if so, uh, do you adjust the time it said you uh, spent sleep uh, to sleep and then woke up? Sometimes you, you took a long time to get to bed, but the watch is tracked as being half an hour earlier. Yeah, you, you click the button on your watch or you click the button on the app on your phone or whatever it might be. And, and it does take you a little bit to get to sleep because then you're conscious of thinking about it and it kind of puts you in that negative spiral. You then wake up and you're like, well, I didn't actually get eight hours of sleep because I probably only got um, I probably only got seven and a half because it took me half an hour to get to sleep. I would, I mean, you can adjust for it. Again, it's a consistency thing, isn't it? It's like, you're going to know when you had that good amount of sleep. And if you're self-reporting, if you're going into like training peaks and writing in your metrics or you're, you're writing down in a notebook, whatever, whatever your method is of tracking how many hours of sleep you got, you're going to know pretty closely how much you got. Um, some of them will track. Um, I've tried sleep tracking before using an Apple watch. Um, I went off it because again, I just stopped using, the, I stopped looking at the data and I was actually, you know, I was finding personally it was stressing me 
out more thinking about tracking my sleep than actually going and just trying to go to sleep and just enjoying the process of falling asleep. So I was finding I was, bit, I was getting a bit, I was, I was getting worse sleep as a result of tracking it. So I, I left it, but there is some, there is some research into some efficacy behind tracking sleep. Um, you're going to get, it, it's similar to what you might get from like, if you're looking at RPE though, as well, like I, if you're self-reporting and going, what time, what time did I go to bed? It took me about half an hour to get to sleep. You're going to have a pretty good idea of when you fell asleep. And then you pretty much know exactly when you wake up. Cause first thing most of us would do is wake up, look straight at the clock or look at our phone and see what the time is. Um, that that's, that's a really easy way to then identify how many hours you got. And then I, the thing with sleep, I really like, and as a, I guess a, a personal use of, of a sleep metric is, is, um, self-reported sleep quality. So how well did I sleep? I would much rather have a really, really, really good seven and a half, or seven hours, seven and a half hours, than have an awful nine hour sleep and, and be sort of wake up and be just like, uh, I was pretty restless. I woke up a few times. It was nine hours collectively, but it, it, I don't feel great when I woke up, but I've had seven and a half hours and I, I wake up and I'm feeling ready to go. I would much rather have that. Um, the quality of sleep is just as important as the quantity. So they're really the two that I look at as a comparison and track. All right, is our is our quality and quantity coming up at the same time? Is our quantity uh, is our quantity really good? But our we're getting eight eight and a half hours, but our quality is really poor. That's not a good thing. That's not meaning getting good sleep at all. That, that's meaning getting awful sleep. So the quality is is probably better. Things like deep sleep. Um, I, I know Zach sort of ch- chimed in on this one and, and talking about um, Shona Holson's work. She is the sleep guru. Um, lucky enough to hear her speak uh, at ACU when I was doing my master's intensive at the start of the year, talking about sleeps and, and, and monitoring sleep in, in ways, not so using devices as such, but more just very simple ways of reporting number of hours and the quality and, and some of those self-report measures and using tra- like diaries for, for athletes to write them in and physically submit them. Um, some of these devices, yeah, are absolutely, absolutely bang on there. It's crazy how some of them, uh, how accurate some of them are. Um, and testing a bunch, uh, I think you mentioned as well, um, she does also recommend Whoop uh, is a pretty good one. I know some others in the space also recommend the, the Aura Ring, like I said before, they're pretty on par and comparable. I mean, it, it goes to show that if if some of the biggest teams and organizations in the world are, are backing some of that technology, it makes sense that that, that would be worthwhile to look into. Um, you don't have to go too far to see the, the majority of the NFL are using Whoop. I think the NBA were all using the Aura Rings during... Um, during their bubble at Disney World as well. So other than just sleep, they were tracking some other HIV metrics and that in terms of COVID as well. But from a sleep perspective, some of them are doing uh, are doing some great things and give you some good data. The, the critical ones are how much deep sleep you're getting. And then if you are looking at some of that more, uh, when I say sleep tracking data and using devices to track your sleep, deep sleep is the critical one. That's where majority of the big recovery blocks are going to be coming from. Um, and then looking at that as a, as a comparison and looking maybe at the, the cycles of sleep and when we're getting deep sleep and when we're coming out of it, trying to time how much sleep you get so you don't wake up in the middle of a deep sleep cycle because then you always generally feel lethargic. Waking up in that lighter sleep um, part of the cycle is always a much better way to, to wake up because you're a little bit closer to that consciousness and you're sort of coming out of it and preparing for it. So uh, that's why that's why things like dreams happen right at the end of it when you sleep or they, they rapidly happen at the end because it's in that light sleep where our, we, we have some rapid eye uh, rapid eye movement things like that where our brain is quite active but our body's not doing a lot the deep sleep is where we go really into that shutdown and that's where the body can have its its best replenishment and, and recovery component so i if you're gonna if you're gonna track it um they're the things to look for you can track it really simply like i said i'm more focused just on quality of sleep now and give myself a bit of a rating whether it's each day or every couple of days or even just on the critical days. If, I, if I've had a big training session or, or a game day and I go to sleep that night, wake up the next morning and go, how well did I sleep out of 10? Do I feel like it was a 10 out of 10 sleep or do I feel like it was a 7 out of 10? Do I feel like it was a 4 out of 10? If I feel like it's a 4 out of 10, I'm going and having a nap later in the day um, because I, I probably feel like I need some extra and try and maybe catch up on some of that quality as well. I need to maybe be a bit more conscious of the following night's sleep uh, as well uh, as well as um, the actual night that I was planning on looking at in the first place. All of these things you've got to be considerate of when you are looking at uh, at, at sleep tracking data. Um, I'm always a big advocate too of simple is simple works. Um, keep it as simple as possible. You, you're gonna 
you're going to get the best insights that way as well because it's going to be really easy to understand. Do you, how many hours of sleep did I get? Eight. How many, what did I rate that? Eight out of ten. You could even multiply those and give yourself a, a self. You could call it your own sleep metric. Um, whatever, whatever you want to call it. That's that's similar to what we do with like RPE. It's like RP, like rating a perceived exertion. How hard was the session out of ten? Multiplied the amount of minutes you were in the session for. That gives us a training load metric. You could do the same for sleep. You could do how quality was my sleep or self-reported sleep quality. It's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be a decent way of thinking about it rather than maybe using a device. Or if you want to use a device and it does it all for you, you just look at the numbers and you know how to interpret them. Great. They're all uh, they're all good ways of doing it. And um, like so I said, some of those devices, some of the devices are definitely going to be better than others. Um, so if you are going to do it, I would go and get something like a Whoop or I'd go and get something like a um, one of the Aura rings and and do it properly, um, knowing that those are going to be much better in terms of validation. But uh, you could do it super simple. It's with like like training load as well. You can do training load super simple. Like I said, RPE multiplied by minutes. That's still going to give you a pretty good comparison to something uh, like a much more complicated method like TSS. Like TSS isn't overall super complicated, but um, it's the it's the type of thing that you, you can compare to RPE times minutes. It is a little bit more in depth, but they're going to give you they're going to give you a training load metric. Same with sleep. If it gives you the information you need, go for it. Um, looking through here, uh, coming back to Zach's uh, Zach's question about uh, the energy expenditures. Oh, okay. So uh, this makes sense now. But I must have misinterpreted it before. You're saying the bike is the bike was higher in terms of energy expenditure than the run. Um, on the on the whole. Like I, like I said, I would expect I would expect running to be higher um, for the most part. But what was I reading the other day? There, there's a great um, review of literature in terms of energy expenditure. There's a couple out there, energy expenditure on devices. Again, depending on the device you've got in terms of accuracy and that as well. Energy expenditure as a whole is always going to be an estimate because the only way you can actually understand your actual energy expenditure is to do... a metabolic analysis of your um of the gases that that you're breathing back out to to understand well how much fuel are we actually burning so you have to be in a lab 100 percent of the time or have a calibrated device that's going to be able to go portable with you which there's some on the market they're quite expensive like we've looked into them before and, and played around with them and some of them are no good and some of them are just crazy crazy dollars to be able to get your hands on them um i, I would like Take that with a bit of a, a grain of salt. Like if you fuel fuel for where you feel you need fuel. If we're talking about post nutrition, if you feel like the run is more draining than what the bike is, fuel up bigger after the after the bike and don't fuel up as much after the. Uh, oh, sorry, the other way around. Fuel up bigger after the run and don't fuel up as much after the bike. If you feel like that's the way it's sort of leaning. Think about what your fueling is like going into it. Um, typically, if you're doing, and I know. Uh, just thinking off without giving away too much of what your program is and you, hopefully you don't mind me talking about it. But if, if we're doing like a big bike and then going into a big run the following day, well, you're probably already a bit depleted if you didn't have enough fuel as well. So that also might be why um, why the numbers are down a little bit in terms of energy expenditure. The body's just retaining a little bit more and not working as, uh, as hard as what it uh, potentially can. That, that's one factor. Um, yeah, uh, like take, take it with a bit of a, bit of grain salt as long as there's consistency to it um and, and you're tracking it and saying all right my run my run volume is increasing and so is that 900 um energy expenditure and my bike volume is increasing so so is that that measure there um again consistency is sort of the key if you're then using it to calculate i've always been a, a little bit against sort of calculating um calculating calories to be able to put back in i just think it's just a pointless complicated process i mean if you want to do it great and hopefully it doesn't turn anyone off doing it that's just my opinion but like your body knows pretty well what when it needs fuel and when it doesn't um and based on how much it's burnt and so if, it, if you think it's telling you it's reading un, i want to say unders if you th if it's telling you 900 and you think it's actually way above what your bike is doing then yeah fuel up bigger time afterwards because you, you're probably needing some of that extra fuel uh, in the system because you have burnt more than what you what you thought. Risk based energy expenditure is pretty ordinary. Even then, like just like you need CO two analysis. Like we, if we look at it just from an oxygen perspective, when we're measuring some using some of the equipment we've got at the lab, 
if we're just measuring oxygen, you you get an awful energy expenditure reading because you need the CO2 to understand how much carbohydrate you're burning because that's a key byproduct of that carbohydrate burn process is we're going to get uh, carbon dioxide. So measuring that CO2 is really, really critical, whereas your watch is going to estimate it. And how it does that is it's more of a, I guess, a general fitness, health and well-being metric that they probably don't expect people doing 20 plus hours a week of training uh, to be looking more into. It's more how many calories did you burn on your 20 minute walk today type type thing. So once the numbers go up and up and up, it probably just it kind of like almost with like VO2 sometimes it just like doesn't really tell you what it actually should be telling you. Um, bit of opinion in that, but uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't read into it massive amounts. Don't don't lose sleep over it. That's for sure. I'd rather you rather you worry about your whoop stuff and, and sleep than than looking at the energy expenditure. Um, I know the question in there uh, talking about the the whoop. I'm just going to leave that one there around bicep or wristband. Like I said, it's just consistent application. You guys might be able to have a, a conversation about that in the chat um, or in the comments on a on a future video. We've just ticked over the 65 minute mark. Some awesome questions and discussion as always uh, in here, guys. Really really appreciate it. Something I did want to point out as well, and I'm just looking at it now, looking over on the channel here, we are very, very close to 2.4 or 2,400 subscribers on the channel. If everyone goes away and shares shares the channel with someone they think might be interested in joining one of these live streams, um, getting involved in the discussion, jumping on, looking at the videos, commenting, etc., share it, go tell them to subscribe. Let's get this up to 2,500. I want to see that two point, turn into a 2.5 very, very soon. The more people we join in on these, the better questions, better discussion we get, and we can continue to grow the community really, really, uh, really, really big beyond what it already is. I mean, it's already taken off uh, incredibly well over the last little while, but let's keep trying to grow it, get to that 2.5, um, and see see where we can go from there. If there's any other questions, chuck them in the chat now. Otherwise, I might uh, wrap it up because I, I am personally a little bit sneakily keen to go and chuck some of the new, new parts on the bike and not do that on the live stream. As I said in the... The, the Instagram poll that I put up, uh, a few people weren't backing me in to be able to do a good job of answering questions and, and putting the stuff together on the bike, but we'll go give it a try now. If there is any other last questions, chuck them in. Otherwise, thanks for joining us tonight. Really appreciate you jumping on as always. Looking forward to next week's live stream. Smashing a little bit of water there. Um, looking forward to next week's live stream. As always, the replay will be up in full. I'll go through, cut some of the questions together. I know we've sort of had a bit of disconnect between some of them so i'll bring some of those parts of the questions together as well um when i go and put through that highlights video look out for some more content coming in the next couple of days too towards the end of the week um gonna try my best to try and keep the, the, the schedule going of one video a day plus the live stream on the wednesdays it, during the week anyway purely from the fact that being back at work now is a little bit busier um i've already i'm working sort of part-time hours and i think I've, over three days being back at the office i'm already ticking over 16 and a half hours for the week so um only supposed to be doing 20 for the week and I've still got Thursday, Friday and Saturday to go. Um, so we'll see how we go. Try and get them in. Again, appreciate everyone jumping in. Guys like Alan, thank you for being members on the on the channel here. If you do want to join, just click that join button down below. You'll be able to see it. Like I'll show you here, just click join or prop it up on the screen to be a part of Team NJ Sports Science. Uh, less of the coffee a month. You can help support the channel. Get a cool little badge next to your name, uh, which is easy to identify in the chat. Gives you a little bit of priority in the chat as well and in the comments but also some other great perks coming soon in terms of maybe some things uh, in regards to apparel, some other stuff uh, that I'm sort of working through and thinking out what, what is going to be best uh, to add on to that uh, down the track. Otherwise, looks like no normal questions in the chat. Again, thanks everyone for joining. We're just about to stick over 70 minutes, which has been awesome again. Some really good long long live streams over the last few weeks because we've got some great discussion. So uh, absolutely happy to jump on and, and talk as much as we need to to cover all of your questions. Keep commenting, keep sharing the uh, sharing the channel. Let's get to 2,500 uh, as quickly as we possibly can. I'm going to leave it there, guys. We'll wrap it up. Thank you for joining in tonight. That is it for this one. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you in next week's live stream or in a video soon. See you later, guys.